So, if I could introduce the uh, first speaker, is Tony Hammond. Uh, Tony has spent uh, many years in the uh, private sector and then uh, considerable time in the U.S. Uh, political environment, shall I say, on Capitol Hill, uh, and is now a commissioner of the Postal Regulatory uh, Authority in the United States. Uh, he's been there since October uh, 2003 um, and will continue to serve until October 2010. So a substantial uh, background and knowledge uh, in the United States regulatory environment. Please welcome Tony. Thank, thank you, Ian, for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you'll have to bear with me in a minute. I haven't done PowerPoint presentations for a while. I must make sure I get the correct button going. So, um, but I also want to thank um, Neil Jackson of, of Triangle Management for inviting me to speak here today, and I also want to thank Triangle's John Mode and all the people that have, that have been behind the scenes and, and have worked hard to put this event together. Uh, it's my pleasure today to talk about the work of the U.S. Postal Regulatory Commission and particularly the changes uh, which have been implemented since the passage of our postal reform legislation at the end of 2006. As you may know, the authority to establish post roads and post offices was contained as long ago as our U.S. Constitution. So for well over 200 years, uh, our national mail system has been seen as an essential part of our national governance and infrastructure. Getting used to this. Okay. For much of the modern era, uh, the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, or what we call the PRA, uh, governed our national mail system. It was the law which removed our old post office from the President's Cabinet. Uh, it established a merit system. Uh, for hirings, for promotions. Uh, it gradually reduced the taxpayer subsidy uh, to the Postal Service, and it also established a break-even mandate to fund the system by revenues. And the Act first created the old Postal Rate Commission to oversee the rate-setting process. So the 1970 law spelled out that the Postal Service was to bind our nation together and provided specific protections to ensure regular mail service to all parts of the nation. Uh, these protections form the basis of our universal service obligation uh, of the Postal Service, which I'll discuss a little bit more later on. The old Postal Rate Commission, which I was originally appointed to by President Bush in uh, 2002, uh, had the primary function to ensure a thorough public review of the Postal Service's price increases to see that they met the, uh, the criteria that we had established by law. Uh, it was a 10-month process of rate filings, hearings, testimony, uh, review, and after that the Commission uh, would recommend price adjustments based on the Postal Service proposals and the findings that we came forth during this process. Um, and while that rate, that rate process was designed to protect the public interest. It was a long process, it was an expensive and cumbersome process, and we found that review of the rate process was the key driver in the new legislation that created a more regulated postal service and changed our functions from Postal Rate Commission into Postal Regulatory Commission at the end of 2006. So, the passage of the Reform Legislation Act, which of the Reform Legislation, which was entitled the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, came after nearly 10 years of debate in our Congress. This was a very long process when they finally passed it. The Reform Act recognized the need to give greater flexibility to the Postal Service to meet the changing demands of today's postal environment. That was the main goal. But it also recognized the importance of promoting greater accountability and transparency in, in, in the system, too. So the new law, therefore, created a more formal regulator 
the Postal Regulatory Commission gave us broader authority than the previous old rate commission in order to balance the greater flexibility that they had given to our postal service. And under the reform law for the first time, our postal service was allowed to earn and retain profits. And all our postal products and services were either categorized as market dominant uh, products or competitive products. The market dominant products account for about 90% of the mail volume that includes our first class mail, periodicals, advertising mail, et cetera. And then for these products, excuse me, for these products, the Postal Service can now raise prices 45 days after they file a notice with us uh, of its intent to do so. So the old cumbersome 10 month long process is gone. And the increases are subject only to a price cap based upon our consumer price index. We calculate that monthly and publish it on our website so that everyone can see exactly where we're at by month as to what to expect when, it, when another rate increase might occur. For the competitive products, the express and the priority services, uh, which comprise the other 10% of volume, there is no, no rate cap. The market determines what the, pr what the price is going to be. And instead there is a price floor that ensures that competitive products do not cross subsidize our market dominant products. And the uh, revenues from the competitive products do have to cover their attributable costs. And the only other requirement is that they cover a portion of the postal services overall cost and we decide that's the overhead cost and overall and the rate regulatory commissions decide what that what that will be uh, the postal service can raise these prices with a 30-day notice and and it goes into effect um, but the provisions also go beyond rate setting they also invest considerable authority in our regulatory commission related to financial reporting and operating practices of the postal service uh, as well as the quality of service that they provide. So who are we? The Postal Regulatory Commission is now an independent agency of the U.S. federal government. We regulate only the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, we don't regulate the entire express or delivery services industry. Uh, our job is to make sure that the Postal Service is competing on a level playing field with its competitors. That's our only role in that. We're a small agency, but we do have a, a considerable mandate. Our mission is, as authorized by Congress, to ensure the transparency and accountability of the U.S. Postal Service and to foster a vital and efficient universal mail system. So this is our current organizational chart. Uh, the commission's made up of five commissioners who are nominated by the president and each are confirmed by the U.S. Senate for a six-year term. Uh, we have a staff of a uh, little more than 60 professionals with expertise in areas such as the law, economics, accounting, finance. Um, our staff complement has grown since the enactment of the reform bill and we're divided into four main offices. Uh, the Office of Accountability and Compliance handles the technical analysis of the rate changes and classifications. They review the Postal Service's financial reportings, uh, the costing information, their accounting records, and service performance measurements and the results. Uh, our Office of General Counsel provides us with the legal expertise and manages our formal complaint process for us. The Office of Public Affairs and Government Relations handles all the communication with the public, with the Congress and the media, other federal agencies, etc. And then finally, our um, Office of Secretary and Administration manages all the administrative matters from all of the filings, our library, our docket room, to technical support and all of the personnel management um, issues. And we also now have, as created by Congress last year, an independent inspector general uh, that was required in the reform legislation. And always where you see public representative in each public proceeding, the commission designates a person to represent the interest of the general public. 
various individuals are given that assignment for each of the cases that come before us and we make available all of our resources for representing the general public. So, um, as I say, the overall role of the PRC is to promote greater transparency and accountability in the system. These two qualities create trust amongst the stakeholders in our country and they provide clarity for our effective decision making. Um, among the uh, specific provisions of the reform bill, we were charged with developing a modern rate system of rate regulation that I touched upon. Uh, we made this a top priority so that the Postal Service could act as quickly as possible in changes in the economy and the postal market. We were able to publish those new regulations fully seven, almost eight months ahead of the statutory deadline and got those into effect at the end of 2007 so that they've been operating under that for almost a year and a half now. And one of our main ongoing functions is to monitor postal cost revenues and service to ensure that they're compliant with the law. Uh, we were also required to consult with the Postal Service on service standards. Uh, this included the creation of a new measurement system, uh, the development of service standards and targets, and the reporting on service performance of the Postal Service. And we also adjudicate complaints uh, from mailers and the public. We recently uh, established a new uh, two-complaint process um, for that purpose. Um, and we also uh, now play an active role in international coastal policy. Uh, we have specific, specific statutory responsibility with respect to rates and classifications uh, negotiated through international agreements. And we have people working full time on that. Our staffer, Allison Levy, in, in the back there, uh, who many of you know and have, have, have dealt with in, uh, over the years, is our senior international policy advisor on those things. And the Act also gave us new enforcement tools. Um, those include subpoena power over the Postal Service and authority to direct the Postal Service to adjust rates and take other remedial actions. And it also gave us the authority to levy fines in cases of deliberate noncompliance with the law. Now, thus far under the new system, we haven't had to consider issuing any subpoenas uh, and we have levied no fines. It's, it's not been necessary in getting any of the information that we need from the Postal Service, but the Act did give us that authority if necessary. And we also have to provide annual reports on performance in the regulatory process uh, each year that we have to send to the President and the Congress and make available to the general public. So, this slide and the next provide uh, more detail on the work of the Commission. Uh, you can find more information on all of these subjects at our, at our website, which we update daily at www.prc.gov, uh, if you're interested. So, in early 2008, we published our first strategic and operational plan. It uh, charts the course of our activities from 2008 until 2012. Um, And I think I wasn't supposed to hit the button yet. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. In March of this year, we published our second annual compliance report. Uh, it provides a comprehensive review of the Postal Service's financial operations and the quality of service. Um, this year, we also completed our second cycle of postal rate changes. Um, two separate actions spanning about a month apart. Uh, we solicited public comment as required by law, and we, ver we verified the legality of all of the rates for the Postal Service as competitive as well as their market dominant products. Uh, the competitive rates went into effect on January 18th of this year. Uh, the market dominant changes are scheduled to take effect next month, on, or excuse me, next week on May 11th. That will include a change in the price of our first class stamp from 42 cents to become 44 cents. Um, we're also working closely with the Postal Service to establish service performance measurement systems, standards, and goals. Um, at the, about 
the present time, 20% of the postal service uh, mail service performance is measured, and we're trying to get that uh, measurement raised to a higher percentage as quickly as possible, and this is one of the priorities that we're working on right now. Um, and, as I said earlier, we now have an expanded role in the international arena. Uh, we helped develop the U.S. position at the Universal Postal Union Congress in Geneva last year, and we have to work with a number of, of U.S. federal government agencies, um, our State Department, the Postal Service, our Department of Commerce, our U.S. Trade Representative, and, and other agencies. <clears throat> And in addition, we also provide the State Department with our formal views uh, on proposals to amend rates and classifications for all of the market dominant products. Uh, that's mandated in the reform legislation also. Uh, in December of last year, we issued a determination on whether 47 different non-postal services that are currently offered by our postal service should be allowed to continue. This was another thing which was contained in our reform legislation. And the Congress told us to consider the public need for the service and the ability of the private sector to, pro to provide uh, to meet that need. A few of the determinations that we had on postal, non-postal products uh, have yet to be finalized because we basically came in big conflict with our U.S. Postal Service. So we're uh, having additional deliberations to try to work our way through the rest of those products. They're still pending. Um, we also issued rules uh, to improve the value and utility of periodic reports that we get from the Postal Service. And we also established two processes for considering the consumer uh, complaints and inquiries that I mentioned. Uh, one of them is the process to handle routine matters, and the other provides for a more thorough review of complex matters as they come up. And the last item, on our list was our study of the Postal Service's universal service obligation. Uh, and I know that some of you may have had a particular interest in that study, so I'll give you a little bit more um, detail. Um, we said, well, we know that from the beginning, the United States Postal Service has a unique history. It's closely tied to the political, the economic, and social development of our nation. Uh, over the years, terms like binding force uh, and universal service have been used to describe it. Um, under the reform legislation, the commission was asked by Congress to examine our overall universal service obligation and to provide it in more detail in report. So we engaged in a year-long study that included a number of public hearings all across the country uh, in various regions, uh, we examined both the historic and the legislative record. Uh, we reviewed USO type studies from around the world in doing so. And on January 30th of this year, we issued that report. It runs some 250 pages, but I'll just briefly mention uh, a few key findings. As this slide indicates, we found that the scope of the USO was quite broad that it includes both competitive and market dominant services, and it requires regular postal service to everyone in the nation. We also estimated the value of the underlying monopoly. Three and a half billion dollars was the figure that we were able to come up with, and that the cost for our USO to the postal service was $4.4 billion. Um, that comes, at, uh, for instance, um, many small post offices lose money, uh, but they're deemed to be a vital aspect of the USO and have basically been protected by our U.S. Congress. So we had to take those things into consideration in providing our report. But um, we found seven specific aspects of our USO, and I've listed them here. Um, the USO is very ec ec mm, inclusive in the United States. It applies everywhere to everyone and to every product and service that the U.S. Postal Service provides. Uh, so if a postal customer in the United States, whether they may live in a remote Alaskan village or in, in downtown New York City, 
uh, whether they mail millions of statements each month or, or only their church newsletter, um, that they do biz whether they do business online um, or at the local post office. They see fulfillment of their basic needs as, as part of our universal service obligation. In addition, our postal customers want their needs fulfilled in an equitable way. They want prices to be affordable, they want consistent service, and they want regularly scheduled deliveries. Uh, some of you may have read or heard about delivery frequency, uh, which has become a topic in the U.S. because our Postmaster General, Jack Potter, uh, recently requested the authority from Congress to go from six-day delivery to the possibility of five-day delivery. Not a mandated change, but simply giving the Postal Service the flexibility, if necessary, to go to five-day delivery. Um, that's to enable the Postal Service to cut their delivery cost. It has been um, discussed variously uh, since that time, and there are still many questions that have to be answered about this proposal. I mean, the Postal Service was very reluctant to even make a recommendation like this. Um, but one of the most important, uh, from our perspective as mandated by law, is that what effect would this have on the universal service obligation? So uh, how would it affect the balance and the equity in the system and all? So postal customers in the U.S. believe that they have rights under the USO. Um, and they understand that the USO is a balance. Um, so in, in our study, postal customers overwhelmingly voiced considerable satisfaction with the current balance and did not want any change. So, as part of our mission, the Regulatory Commission serves to protect that balance, and it's our role to ensure that any changes in the postal system include an understanding and an effect of our universal service obligation, which may be unique. But um, this is just a, a quick overview of the status of postal reform uh, in the U.S. and the role that the Postal Regulatory Commission uh, plays. We're in the midst of a very dynamic postal environment, as all of you know, um, and it's been magnified even by the, the, the current economic problems. But I, I do invite you to visit our website uh, to review any and all of the documents and proceedings. We put them up continually, um, and we strive simply for ac accountability and transparency. That was what they created the Regulatory Commission before. So, um, I thank you for your attention on that, and I'll be happy to answer uh, questions uh, as we get on after our other presentations. So, uh, thank you very much.